guess they called it a small uh, Bible study group, but we're getting bigger and bigger, and that's just awesome. That's like amazing over the last yeah, six months. Yeah, we're big today. Life groups. Yeah, I know life group. Yeah, I said that earlier. Oh. Um, anyway, <laughs> life group. No one in the on the internet on the church website. It's under your name. That, that's what I started to say. So, yeah, life group slash Bible. But anyways. We're in a situation where it allows us to engage in conversation, talk, feedback, and so forth, which is unique and, and really neat. Um, and uh, I know I'm glad I'm here, and uh, it's a blessing to have each one of us here. We've got a couple new people I know that filled out. Uh, is there anybody else new for the first time other than we have uh, Tony and Heather Tony that are Heather. here? Hi, Tony. Uh, Nicole over here. Nicole. Nicole? The people and some other new people. What are your names? Kevin and Maria. Okay, Kevin and Maria. Thank you. Woo -hoo!
I mean, I joke around a lot too, and I tend to be, I don't know, what would you call me, Laquita? What? Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> She's kind of like the class manager. She's also my master. She's only behind the real master, but she cracks a whip. And, uh, I don't know, I can come off kind of maybe overly stodgy. joking. Stodgy is a good word. What is it called? Stodgy. I don't know what that means, so that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not really that much of a uh, uh, hard guy like that. But anyway, I got a big mouth because uh, I work on the phone during the day and I collect money from companies that owe other companies money, so I can be uh, kind of assertive at times, but anyway, it's all in the good of uh, bringing us together here tonight, so anyways, I'm rambling on a lot, and uh, tonight I'm especially excited too because Larry's got a thing going where we're dealing with giving our testimonies, and each week a couple people have been coming up and sharing their own personal testimony, because that's probably the best way for us to witness out there in the world. And um, tonight, actually, Larry's going to give his testimony. Also, uh, our good friend and brother Stu, a member of our class, is also going to do his tonight. He's got a little bit different flavor to give on his, too, because he's um, one of the good guys, one of the chosen. And um, anyway, it's going to be very, very good. And uh, anyway, any other things I missed, the Puyo, which I'm sure I did? Or, oh, wait a minute. Um, Steve had something to say. Steve is involved with uh, an outreach. Um, yeah, we've got nursing home tomorrow, uh, Manor Care Nursing Home on Sunrise Boulevard, 2.30 to 4. And we also have it next Sunday. So it's the fourth, and uh, we have five Sundays in this month. So for those of you who haven't been, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, if, you, if you want to practice that testimony, this is a great place to do it. Uh, we've been doing this ministry now for, for well over 10, 12 years, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's very informal. Uh, we, we sing a few uh, old-time hymns, uh, we talk a little bit, and then we spend a lot of time with the, with the residents there. Uh, last month we had uh, over 20 residents in the main dining room, and then we went down and visited uh, probably another 10 in the room. So. Wow. Uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful ministry. It's an easy ministry. And uh, we, if we have... It's a captive audience, right? Absolutely. <laughs> right, right. That's why I say if you want to practice your testimony, they can't hear you anyway. So, <laughs> so uh, it's a great place to work out the case. So, uh, but but uh, uh, if we have 10 folks from our group, uh, that's enough for uh, us to, to have enough people to sit down and talk to the folks there as well as... As well as having some folks to uh, visit the rooms. If you have a small dogs or any kind of dog, I got a huge dog, so uh, Goldie the Greyhound always goes. Uh, really? So, uh, they love dogs. They or love children, pets. bring your children. Uh, and kids too, yeah, they exactly. Uh, uh, they, they love kids, they love dogs. Uh, it's just a good time, and it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry. So tomorrow, 2.30, uh, if anybody needs directions, uh, I'll give it to you real quick, but you can see me afterwards. It's on Sunrise Boulevard, mm -hmm. uh, one mile east of University. It's literally across the street from Plantation High, uh, 6931 uh, West uh, Sunrise Boulevard. So tomorrow at 2.30 as well as next next Sunday at 2.30. Thanks, Steve. That's, yeah, that's really an awesome thing because um, as we can imagine, there's a lot of seniors that are in that sort of situation, some of them maybe don't even have family that come to see them or not that often or whatever, but just to show them that we care and uh, like you said, share, wow, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, after class, if anybody's interested, see Steve, because that sounds like a, a very valuable thing. Um, anything else? You need to, any questions? Where's Greg? Just that one. Greg, question? Yeah, the picnic last week. We were there. It was good. We even got to watch a little of the Dolphins game on the TV. And uh, it was good food, good times, good fellowship. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, yeah, it was a seven-inch screen, but 
It seemed like a 70-inch screen. Right? That wasn't the main focus, but it was kind of neat to be able to check it out, too. So, anyways, hi. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if anybody here left a phone in the restroom, but... Oh, I did. Oh, is it yours? That's oh, me. Oh, cool. Oh, man. Good. Thank you, sir. Yeah, she Perfect. found it there. Thank you. Awesome. I'm glad it was from our class. There. <laughs> All right, so that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and open this up in prayer, and then queen has got another thing, though, too, right? Yeah, okay. <coughs> How is this waving? Oh, I thought it was something else. People are waving to me. All right, so that. Yeah. Oh, the clipboards, are those still going around? I got one. Okay. Just uh, keep those moving and end up moving them this way. When you get it, finally move it this way so that Marty can make copies for everybody. Um, and. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and open this up in prayer, and then uh, Larry's going to start us. So, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for this opportunity to be together. Um, thank you for your awesome house that you give us to meet and worship in and study your word. Um, we want to pray for family, relatives, and friends, those that couldn't be here tonight. I know there's a few that went to the other coast to deal with um, a class member who had uh, a family uh, passing and um, travel mercies to them and to anyone else who couldn't be here and just thankful that everyone could make it here tonight. Um, we want to pray for everything you give us uh, sufficiently and abundantly and we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you and pray for anyone in need, anyone sick or ill that needs healing. Um, touch them. Help us to be better Christians. Help us to be a, a light in the world out there. We want to pray for the leaders of our government, for, for the people that protect us here, our country, and the blessing that God gives our country. And just want to thank you so much for your son who lived and died for us and to forgive us of our sins. And just want to ask these sayings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Yeah, good job. Um, I'm, I'm going to really step out and uh, you, you, you know, talk about Curry. I'm going to talk for two minutes about politics. Uh-oh. Uh Here we go. Uh, are we ready? Uh -oh. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> I got some earplugs if anybody needs any. Just uh, kidding, Larry. No, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, because, you know, this is an election year, obviously. A lot of things are going on. And I've been asked different questions. And, um, but I've heard in the last couple of weeks something that disturbed me. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put it out there. And what I've heard was from about three or four different folks was I'm so disappointed or I'm so discouraged or I'm so confused or I'm so this or I'm so, I'm not even voting this year. <laughs> So here's my, here's my bit on the politics. <clears throat> Too many men and women have shed their blood for your right to vote. Amen. And to not to vote, to not sound your voice. I don't care who you're voting for. My dad used to tell me, as a former military man, I may not agree with your opinion, but I'll fight for your right to have it. Right. That's the American way. Mm -hmm. So whatever your thoughts are, whatever your, wherever your heart leads you, wherever the platform you agree with the most, do it yourself, do this country a favor, and go vote. It's too important. There's been too much sacrifice, and that's that's offensive to them. If they knew, if they're over a certain country, they say, well. They don't even want to vote, and I'm over here fighting for them. Mm -hmm. I think they'd be deeply, deeply disappointed. So, do the most privileged and honorable thing that you have 
in this country, and that's your voice where you get a chance to win. Punch the ticket to the way you want to. Amen? Amen. 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 It wouldn't be right for me not to interject. <laughs> uh, we are Christian people first. Now you take it as you want it, but remember this. God doesn't compromise on two things, marriage and abortion. And me personally, if either one of those candidates can't agree with that, I won't vote for either one. Because God wants my heart. God has already set the standard, so I'll never have to compromise why I voted for someone or didn't vote, because my standard is based on what the Bible says. Not on what man says. I'm, not, I'm a Christian first, not a U.S. citizen, I'm a Christian. So let's make sure that we understand that if I'm voting for a guy who's, who's agreeing to gay marriage, how can I go behind the court and say, oh, marriage is between a man well, and a woman? Well, well, well. well, all I'm saying is, well, <laughs> <laughs> you have a right to it, and uh, we, that wasn't where we were going. Where we were going, and I want to stick to it, was just the fact that there's been too much sacrifice, and that's, what, that's how change happens is that we have the opportunity to cast our, our vote. And, uh, and uh, so that's the most important. Uh, that's my opinion. Just like I said, you know, I may not agree with your opinion, but I'll fight for your right to have it. And that's the American one. OK, now, with that being said, I'm going to just say something real quickly about my testimony. Uh, I'm going to share a few minutes with you on that, because it's a, it's a daisy. And you should be recording it quite <laughs> But I grew up in a country uh, that I've shared a lot of time with you, in a little country church. And we had a pastor that uh, went to two or three different country churches because that's what they did. She, he and or she was on a circuit. And um, so if you didn't go to Sunday school or church, not only did some of your classmates not know it, normally the whole village, I can't say a whole town because it wasn't a town, it was really a village. But at any rate, we grew up in the church. Like Pastor David said, I think he says it most appropriately when he says, I was in church nine months before I was born. And, uh, or something to that effect. And uh, that's a little bit the way I was. But at any rate, so I grew up in the church, I really, I, I remember I was 12 years old. The only church we had in our community was a, a Methodist church. So I was sprinkled when I was 12 years old, and that was called baptized. And, uh, uh, but I know I did not feel the Holy Spirit. I know that. I know that I thought, why didn't I get the wow factor? Why didn't I feel something? And I know the reason why was because as I look back on it, it was sort of like the thing to do. When you turn 12, it was almost like the opposite of the bar mitzvah. You got baptized. And so I went through the motion. And then as I got into my teenage years and we moved away from the country, we moved into a, a larger town, which to me was like a city. Uh, I found out what uh, running around was. I found out what skipping school was for the first time. I, I started to learn things that... Uh, I was not aware of. And by the way, I just found out that I wish I'd had the opportunity to talk to Rod about this. You're from Melvindale, Michigan? Yes. That's where my relatives are from. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I don't know if you're, uh, you're, you're the other Christophers, Ronnie Christopher. I don't know if you know or not. But at any rate, the point being, it was around the same age. Uh, but at any rate, so we visit and. Uh, and so when I started growing into my teen years, I got uh, ornery. Not well, just ornery. And most importantly, what I started doing was, is I started taking away my time with Christ. I started taking away my time with church. And I sort of liked it. You know, and I was doing other things. And uh, I got busy doing other things. And, uh, then I was, uh, when, when I graduated high school, I was lucky enough that God was looking out after me and gave me a, a young, beautiful wife, uh, Marty. Uh, and uh, 
I was her first kid. You know, a lot of times you say, do you have any children? She, she could easily say, yeah, I married one. <laughs> because she, yeah, she was waiting for me to grow up. If some, if one of the guys would say something, I was there, man. I say, you know, I'm yep. And anyhow, I was doing my thing. We had two beautiful children, but I wasn't back to Christ. When I was about, uh, we were 27 years of age. We were now fast forwarding just a little bit. 27 years of age. Oh, by the way, when I was young and growing up in the church. I always thought I was about 12 years old, played the guitar, and sang in the church, and uh, I was about uh, 10 or 11 years of age when I was asked to uh, say prayer, the prayer in church, and I had no fear. Did somebody ask me to do something? Absolutely. I just walked right out there and do it. I had no brains. That's a great one. <laughs> so I would do these things. But at any rate, uh, all of a sudden, I started to feel this, this pull. And uh, not a bad guy, but I wasn't a good guy because I wasn't a Christ follower. And at 27 years of age, our local church that we were attending at this time now in Delaware, Ohio, had like a little, um, uh, pardon me? Revival. Yeah, they had a, like, like a revival week. They had gone ahead bringing in different speakers almost every night. Well, on a Wednesday night, they brought in this one, this one speaker with his little group, and it was like God had the spotlight right on. He spoke right to me, and he called me out. And all of a sudden, I felt the Holy Spirit for the first time. I got up out of my seat. My wife and my two kids joined me. I walked down. I gave my life to Jesus Christ at that time when I was 27 years of age. Never looked back. I was lost in a way that I was confused and I was just rejecting. Um, when I accepted Jesus Christ that time, that, that night, in Delaware Christian Church, in Delaware, Ohio, it was like, pow. And I was just filled with the Holy Spirit. And since that time, Christ has worked in miraculous ways in my life. Uh, I was, uh, for a long time, about big cigars and motor cars. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to, whatever I could build, whatever I wanted to do, I would try to build businesses, and I was successful doing that. At times I had about 300 people working for me. Uh, I sold, bought, sold companies, I built companies, uh, not all successfully. Uh, but Christ was not a part of that. And then when I accepted Him as my Savior, I accepted him in a way that was still sort of like part time. I was like the pencil I was told. Honestly, yeah. it was like he was my weekend <coughs> fix. But Monday through Friday, I was still Larry on my own trying to do my thing. And as I matured and I started to grow up in the Word, God started revealing things to me that was unbelievable. I started learning them and understanding them for the first time. My wife had a lot to do with that. And we would sit down together, we would study together, we would read together, and then I got more involved, but I never got really where I served the church. I served it on my terms, but I was taking one step at a time. And then to fast forward, how God has worked in my life is the fact that he's allowed me to share my story with so many others. And then he's allowed me to mature and be a vehicle to him in a way that I never imagined I could be. And the fun thing about it is I look forward to it now. Not that I didn't before, but I didn't really ask. I didn't really say, Lord, use me any way you can. I was more like, man, 
that's great that Joe's doing that, and that's great that Stuart's doing that, and Melinda, you know, she's doing her thing. And I acknowledge them, but you know, I couldn't do that. I didn't, I didn't feel called to do that until he grabbed me by the shirt and said, "Hey, you need to dive in the beach." In the vehicle. So when I was able to get over my own pride, because that's what was standing between me and Christ, totally, and I finally understood it was a matter of me taking down that wall called pride. Because I wanted to be up here. And I knew, I finally found out the big secret that to be up here, I had to go down here. And then things started changing for me. And then it come full circle. Last year I was asked by this church and I was ordained to be a full pastor. I would have never guessed that in my wildest dreams. We're taking an offering. <laughs> so much to be able to take that. I was baptized again. I was, I was at one of the beach baptisms. And um, my grandson was baptized with me. And that was now, it was for me. When I was 12, it was. I went because it was the thing to do. But after I got on my knee to Christ, and as I grew and matured in His Word, then I understood that relationship that is a love relationship and how much he cares for me and how much he cares for all of us and uh, so my my uh, bottom line to that is if you would see the village or see where I came from and had an opportunity to take a video of my life as we sort of moved through it from step to step to step um, I think it hit home the most when one of my uncles came to visit. Uh, excuse me, I went, we were visiting them. And he said, we used to feel so bad for you kids when you were growing up. I was about 20 at this time. I was the youngest in the family. And I said, I feel bad for us for Because you guys didn't have anything. We grew up in the, in the city. We had movie theaters. We had this. We had that. We had nothing. But we didn't know it. We had we didn't have a home. Or excuse me, we didn't have a house. We had a home, and in that home, uh, through my parents, uh, Christ was one of our residents. It was me that walked away. It wasn't the Christ one. And that's the way it is with us. We have a tendency to walk away. He'll never leave us, and he never left me. And I didn't realize that all those years, he was right here. And so I just uh, want to share that with you, that if you had an opportunity, or that if you sort of went through that time in your life where you walked away from Christ, I can tell you unequivocally, I'm not a favorite. I can tell you that he's just waiting for you to come back and say, I'm sorry. I want to come home. And he's not going to judge that. He's just going to be standing there in open arms and said, I've been waiting for you. So go God. Go Jesus. Yes. Um, we want to move this thing along because Stuart, Brother Stuart, he's going to come down and share his testimony in one of our Jewish believers. Yes. And, um, And then he's going to share a little bit on how to, how to witness to your Jewish friends. This really? is really going to be interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. It's ran by the computer. There's nothing we can do about it. Thank you. Hello. So, how is everyone tonight? Good, good. Yeah, great. Yay. Okay, well, thank you, Larry. And, uh, you know, Larry's such an inspiration. And, uh, I'm going to give a 
as brief a testimony as I can so I can get into a little more about understanding about really the Jewishness of Jesus. If you understand the Jewishness, then you can talk to anyone. You know, there's so many biblical verses as I was studying and looking through the Bible, but, um, you know, basically Jesus was Jewish, right? So, and as Larry was mentioning, that we've got to be more like him and less of us. And, uh, you know, that pride factor that I had to find out that there was this God, that his name was Jesus. And it was a big revelation to me, and it took me a year of really uh, stumbling over that fact to really come to understand that he is the Messiah that was foretold in the Old Testament, right? So uh, I just want to get a word of prayer. And, uh, Father God, we just thank you for this evening. Thank you for all that we gathered here tonight. We thank you that we can come and share your word, share our testimony. And just uh, all things point to you, Lord, and we just thank you again for all that's here tonight for this church and for his word. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And like I said, this class is very important to me because uh, part of my testimony, I would go in the middle first and I would go backwards, I guess, but I came to the church in like 2000, January 2002 after I was coming out of divorce, I was very broken. And uh, I had been exposed to Christianity in 1984, so uh, I wasn't really touched as yet. So this church was really my first church that I had sunk in. About maybe took me six months or so to come find a, a small uh, group that probably Pastor David did a little lesson on getting involved. And, you know, I happened to come to Larry's class and been here ever since, since 2002. And, uh, so I feel like an old timer sometimes, and so many new people are here, and it's such a blessing to see so many new people with new faces, as well as mixed with the other folks that have been here for a while. But then I'll start back at the beginning. Um, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and to a nice Jewish family. You know, we lived in a nice Jewish place uh, called Squirrel Hill, you know, a little Jewish enclave in Pittsburgh, where all the Jewish delicatessens are. And, um, but my parents divorced when I was like about three or four years old. And the family was moved to Toledo, where my grandma lived, and um, lived with her. And, you know, basically I grew up without my father. You know, uh, I know there was a lot of fighting, and uh, as a young man, I can remember, you know, my mother actually pulling off bloody clothing from when she had gone back to visit Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of anger and uh, just a difficult marriage. You know, in those days you got married so you can have sex. Yeah, they, you know, you weren't allowed. So I think marriage has come a long way to, uh, you know, young people that didn't know what they were doing necessarily for marriage sake. And to, but people would come together. I, I don't know if that's true. That's just my opinion. But, um, you know, they had a rough time with it. And got, I got my parents were divorced when I was very young. So we moved to Toledo. I happened, we were on a walk, I think in the middle of winter, and I fell in front of a dry cleaning store, and out comes the owner, and it, he met my mom and asked me for a date, and that's how my mom met my stepdad. You <laughs> 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 And so uh, my mom got married in Toledo, Ohio, so I was age 17, and throughout those years, what happened in the dry cleaning store, you know, they were doing all the street street changes, and, uh, you know, totally lost the business, the dry cleaner had his clothes, and after a while, you know, my mom was the main breadwinner. So my dad would work wherever he could, the various jobs. Um, but because, you know, it's like my mom led the household, and I was the only son, I I had two sisters, stepsisters, older stepsisters, one real sister, and then they had one uh, younger sister. So I was in a household of four sisters. I was the only son. And I could do anything I wanted, you know, I'd run around, stay all day at night, run the neighborhood. And very irresponsible is what, you know, the main point, that uh, I didn't have a father figure. My stepdad really didn't step up to the plate to be, you know, any kind of uh, authoritarian figure. And I really, you know, I was, I was allowed to do whatever I wanted to do. 
Um, which was not a good thing, you know. I thought it was good at the time, but uh, I'd sneak down the house late at night, go with my friends Charlie, and we'd be the terror of the neighborhood in the middle of the night. <clears throat> but um, until I grew up in a good school, at age 17, uh, we actually came down and moved in the middle of my senior year. And probably I was exposed to getting high around 15 or 16, uh, starting to smoke pot with my friend Charlie, my friend Charlie's best friend, and he was up in Sarasota, but um, started getting high. So when I got down here at age 17, and I was in the middle of my senior year, you know, it was a real tough transition. It was an open air school, you know, I wasn't used to <coughs> girls wearing next to nothing. Uh, you know, the school was just somewhere to go, you had to graduate. And um, I'd go home at lunchtime get high. Come back to, you know, I was getting high on a daily basis uh, in my senior year and it continued on. But um, procrastination was always a big problem. You know, I, part of my childhood, I would remember sitting in front in the willow, the willow tree we had and just uh, thinking about, you know, what was me, you know, very depressive uh, patterns that I had as a young, I guess, uh, <coughs> from my childhood. And, um, and in my senior year, basically I was seeking uh, a lot of, in the holistic area about, uh, you know, overcoming depression and positive thinking. I'd read positive thinking books like Norman Vincent Peel. And, uh, but you know, it's a funny thing in those books, they use biblical verses. And one of them, I can remember, said, uh, you know, if he is for us, who can be against us? Mm -hmm. Amen. And, you know, that just struck a chord in my heart, even though I didn't believe, you know, and that wasn't for me. But that types of verses that are in that book just kind of struck a chord in me. And uh, my first exposure probably early on, uh, I was 16, working at Ponderosa Steakhouse with my first real job, and I can always remember this guy named Tom Buck, and he was the hardest worker guy. He'd come in and bust his butt uh, to do whatever it takes, but carry his Bible with him every time. Mm -hmm. And he would always tell me how special I was. And I never did believe it, you know, or understand, but uh, I just remember that there were certain influences and certain people that came into my life. Um, it kind of like introduced me to Jesus in just very small ways, but again, you know, I was Jewish, it's not for me, and I just carried on my life. You know, having a relationship with God, just the fact that I was Jewish and supposed to be special in some way, but, um, you know, just carrying on our lives <coughs> on our own strength, you know. Uh, but anyway, I ended up going to the University of Miami, I didn't know anything about schools down here, I said, you know, I waited for the last minute, of course, to decide. But I got enough scholarships to go and um, ended up going there and just the full first year was a big party and getting high. But um, I remember catching myself just in time to get good grades and, you know, study. <coughs> but um, really I was kind of lost, just drifting in life. And I came home after uh, one year of college, started working at American Express and moved up the ranks very quickly. Just, I don't know how. Uh, not because I was, you know, I had college, but just because I moved up through, um, through the ranks very quickly and opportunities came up where I was actually helping to run the computer center of American Express at the age of 21. And uh, I'd say this, you know, not to boast, but just to tell you what, what was happening here. Uh, because I thought it was hot stuff, wearing a tie every day, coming in and having this great job. And, you know, I'd come in, we'd have a corporate uh, meeting with the, you know, very top people in the, in the um, American Express as far as the jobs for the day and how the, you know, controlling the billing, you know, customer service, everything, things for that computer. So I had this great job, but I always was lacking, you know, I was chasing, you know, the party afterwards. In fact, our entire computer was getting high. Um, we go out to lunch, we smoke pot, we go to the local Japanese place drinking sake, and just basically come back wasted. Okay? Um, I can remember gambling also. There's a guy in our department that was a bookie, 
He was Italian. And, um, you know, basically at some points I was given my paycheck over to this guy, you know, and I was just getting sick and throwing up. And, but, you know, these are just some of the things I did and uh, part of my addictive behavior, okay? And uh, afterwards, America, with American Express, I was had this great job, but I believe there's, uh, you know, something let me out. And I think all the time, you know, God, I had the back of my mind, but I wasn't making enough money in order to support my party. You know, it was more important that, you know, my bills were now equal or greater than my paycheck, and I was always seeking, you know, that what could I do to be free and be rich and, you know, live in a country club lifestyle like my real father has in Pittsburgh. You know, growing up, uh, he lived in Pittsburgh still and had the tennis club, the big house, and, you know, no one told me that it took work to get there, you know. <laughs> I just thought somehow it's going to get there. And I actually left American Express uh, probably when I was like 23 to seek out this job that I thought I had. It was going to make me all this money. And uh, anyway, at age 25, I was totally broken. You know, I knew my life, that job didn't work out. It was just a mess. And uh, I remember seeing a park bench with the sign of NA, the Cox Anonymous on it, and a phone number. And I called the 800 hotline. And this guy answered. And I said, My name is Bruce. I didn't want to tell my real name. My, my middle name is Bruce. And, um, he talked to me, I came in for a meeting, it was wonderful, you know. Girls were coming up to me and hugging me, and I said, okay, I got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, just everything about NA was welcoming, and they, one thing they taught you to do is pray. And so they say, get down on your knees at night, thank, you know, ask them for a good day, and get, basically get down on your knees in the morning, and uh, thank you for a good day. And uh, sure enough, I was doing that, you know, and I had nothing else to lose, right? You know, I, I was so broke. <coughs> Suicide was an option at that time because, you know, my life, I just wasn't happy. I'd be gone from the pinnacle, having this great job, to basically not, nothing. And uh, I would just pray, you know, do what they told me to do. And what things they tell you to do is come to meetings 90 days and uh, 90 meetings in 90 days and see what you get. You know, you can always go back in here. So I said, okay, let me give that a shot. And sure enough, um, after the 90th day, it was like 10 days before the Orange Bowl. And that's 1983, 90, you know, right at the uh, end of the college season. And of course, that's the first year of Howard Snellenberger and the Miami Hurricanes, which I remember I went to the University of Miami. They're going up against Nebraska. It was, it, was, it was a big game of the year, and it was 10 days before the game, and I really wanted to get hot. But I was so into Miami, I said, okay, God, if, uh, if I stay clean, you know, you'll you have the Hurricanes win. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, you know, I stayed clean. It was one of the great, great games of all time, and the last second tipped away, second, you know, they went for a two-point conversion, and Miami won. I still think to this day it's because I prayed that <laughs> So, uh, and really it's not that funny because I tell you, the day that I prayed, the wind was howling and it, it was just a beautiful spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. And then when they did win, I, you know, I was thanking the Lord. Um, you know, and I didn't know who it was yet. You know, I was just thanking God for whoever this God was. Um, for keeping me clean, basically, because I was really getting, getting, getting used. So, uh, fast forward, uh, I continued to go to NA, and uh, was a big part of that for a long time. And this guy would stand up in, in a meeting and just start preaching. His name's Lee Sander, and he's over in Navy. Um, we're still friends today, and this guy would just, instead of sharing his testimony or whatever the topic was, he would just get up and just share Jesus, you know, he's your higher power. And, you know, my uh, hair and my arms would stand up, and people were trying to get him to sit down. But uh, he kept coming back and sharing his stuff, and one day I went up to him and I said, well, you know, I'm Jewish, tell me about this, you know, why, you know, how the conversation went, he told me to go to a Jewish temple, a Messianic temple, 
in Rome Kadesh. And uh, I went and sure enough, they gave me this black book that was the prophecies of the Old Testament fulfilled. And I would take that book. At that same time, I had the, like the Polonado cyst removed from my back. And uh, I had to take a bath every night. So I took this book into the bathtub with me. And I would come out after reading this book and being in the bathtub. So physically clean, but so feeling so spiritually clean. I mean, I, I just felt cleansed. And I was, you know, knowing that this book was so I could really get my attention. But I had to make sure this wasn't Christian propaganda, you know. That this stuff was real, it has to be in the Bible from my Old Testament, given to me from my temple that I grew up with. And I tore apart the garage, I could not find this Bible anywhere. A couple weeks later, I was still reading this book, and I said, you know what, i got to go back in that garage and find that Bible. And sure enough, I'm sitting like right on top of a box, right in plain view. So I believe that was one of the miracles along the way um, that really showed me, you know, if you seek, you shall find, right? And um, so after reading this stuff and seeing that these verses were really true, you know, I had the head knowledge that, hey, maybe it is true. Jesus is this Messiah, this Jewish Messiah. And um, when it took a year of still saying, no way, you know, coming back, the struggle was still on. But eventually it went from the head knowledge to the heart. And, uh, you know, music was a big part of that. One of the other miracles that happened, I started going back to work at a good job with Four Power and Light, and I had to drive to Miami every day. And, uh, you know, they said, you know, part of getting your life back together, work on getting your job back, and uh, getting, um, being a productive member of society. So I went back to Four Power and Light, and uh, the first day, there was a rainbow over the piano, you know. It was just another miracle that I thought, you know, I just, Praising God, and I probably first bent my knee, you know, and gave my my heart to the Lord. Driving to Miami, Luis Palau would be on at like four in the afternoon every day, and like that's when I was driving to work. And uh, I tell you, thank God for WMCU and other <coughs> ministries on the radio. The music became like my church. Um, so that was back in '84, and. Just, I, I'd just be listening to music. I'd never wanted to go to the church. I experimented, you know, went to a few different churches for a little while until they got to know me, you know. Uh, like I didn't want to be committed, didn't want to feel responsible. Uh, never really had that, again, responsibility or commitment to a church until I came here in 2002. So, but Christian music was everything. I would go to truth concerts, and I don't know if anyone heard of the group truth. Yes. Uh, call myself a truth groupie, right? And um, then For Him came out of Truth. I'm sure a lot of people may have heard the Truth For Him, a guy's band, uh, great, great music. And even my mom would come to concerts with me. Anytime they came to South Florida, they would try to bring my mom. And one of those concerts was right here at, uh, at the old church on University. And, um, you know, so when I came back, again back to. Uh, when I was really broken after my divorce in 2002, it was January, I remember, and there's a big banner on the university, and my mom even told me, she said, hey, there's a church on the street, and uh, contemporary music on Saturday night, so I said, okay, I'm there, you know, let me go, because I was totally broken after my divorce, I was really getting high, this is back in the 92 to uh, early 2000s, I was getting high every day. My wife had a great job. I was able to just kick back. Um, you know, I, I still did some work, but really, basically, I was getting high every day. And, um, you know, even though I was born again, Christian, listening to Christian music, you know, that's what I did. So I came into this church, and sure enough, two members of Truth were up there on the stage singing. Of course, Pastor Dave. So I said, you know, I knew I was home. Um, it was just me, just I knew, seeing those guys on stage and beautiful music, that this is, this is a good church, and uh, this is where I started to come on a regular basis. So the, <clears throat> we'll just try to wrap up my testimony here, but uh, you know, coming to Bible study, it's just a blessing. I can't say enough about Larry and over the years, you know, how he's gotten the word here. And often I kid Larry, I said, I don't come to listen to Pastor David, I come to, come to find out.
class is where uh, it's my main focus, but you know, that's a joke, you know. It's uh, it's just a question. You were to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> It's really a blessing, and um, you know, I go to a, a messianic church, a temple on Friday nights. Try to get there on Saturday at any time if I can. But uh, come to church by the glades on Saturday night, and I'm usually at Calvary on Sunday, so I get the full boat. You know. And uh, just chase the word. You know, my life is uh, it's good, but uh, I let it all you know be of the Lord, you know, pretty much. And um, what a blessing, you know, to just be chasing the word and to be able to go back to NAA and, 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 and minister and, and be the guy that proclaimed the name of the Lord in those meetings. Uh, I do it probably a little more subtly than the other guy did, but I know that that's part of my ministry is to go back and, and still share, which is another beautiful thing. But um, so that, you know, pretty much talks about my story. The key thing is. Two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Four minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> I, um, I'm sorry, you know, I, this is my favorite subject. Praise God. I appreciate it. But part of the, uh, my ministry, or what happened to me, I was going to Calvary on a Sunday afternoon, and um, they had their straight prayer ministry on Sunday afternoon, and I'd see this guy laying down in his and I had to go up to him and say hello to him, and this guy was named Jimmy. And uh, Jimmy, you know, after I met him, he introduced me to another fellow in Hallelujah Day. And uh -huh. <clears throat> Hallelujah Day, anyone will remember, uh, because, you know, said, okay, I'll come to your church, you come to my church. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Brother Don, back there, is a good friend of Hallelujah Day. He was the guy that, you know, even though I had this, you know, I was Jewish and I was starting to believe and I was Christian, where I was starting to really share the word and get the word in me, you know, because everything off this guy's lips was biblical, talking biblical uh, stuff, and, um, you know, I know he touched a lot of hearts here, and there's some people that are still here today because of how Dave day and Jimmy. Um, so he was really my mentor, and uh, I can't say enough about him, but uh, that's where I really got the word in me, I got to share, and his, uh, you know, I hope that I can be invited back to share my my lesson for the night course. Thanks a lot to what I'm sharing. Okay. Now, as we've been teaching, he has violated everything that I've taught. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's doing. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I know it's hearing from his heart, and when you go down that road, it's, it's, it's so much you think you want to share and you want to people to understand because every chapter of your life is important and uh, he left so much out at the same time. I mean, uh, the, the relationship with his family uh, got in trouble. Uh, that that uh, broke as it often does with uh, sometimes with uh, Jewish believers. We have several, we have a half a dozen or so Jewish believers in our class and uh, that's one that, that each of them seem to have one thing in common, that would be the thread that says when I accepted Christ, I was asked to either leave the house or I was uh, I was just uh, uh, not accepted anymore. I was kicked out. I might have been uh, any uh, I was maybe it had been written out of will. Uh, anything of this nature because it's a very very serious decision uh, and it's one that's very offensive to a hard fast Jewish believer who has those traditional beliefs. So we have to pray about that. So in order to witness to our Jewish friends, that's an important thing. I mean, if we're, we're getting ready to do the Seder again. It's coming around the corner, and, and that's a big thing that our class puts on. Last year, we had 200 people. Uh, our Jewish uh, it's a messianic message. So hopefully we're going to be able to do more than that this coming year. So uh, next week, uh, I promise, we, we got a lot in, uh, we got started a little late. 
that if we, we did not dig into the work, uh, we certainly will do that next week. I hope you come back. Uh, and, and, uh, so you'll see what, how exciting it is when God's Word comes alive Amen. and it reaches out and touches you and grabs you and shakes you a little bit and stirs you up and uh, you want to go out and uh, share the gospel to others. And by starting, the way to start that is by sharing your own testimony. But let's keep it the five-minute version. Let's keep it the five-minute version. And uh, I know uh, Stu wanted to go into a lesson tonight, but I think, again, sometimes it's easy to see how much time you can spend on it. So, uh, but it was all good stuff. I enjoyed listening to everything he said and everything he shared. Uh, okay, but I want to pray, and uh, we're going to eat, uh, because with this Italian night, we've got everything going. we got a salad, we've got a full course meal. You're going to start with a salad, we got the, uh, we got, uh, Something. Uh, we got light balls and sauce. Uh, we got we got dessert. Uh, we got the birthday uh, girl with Pat, and uh, we have a birthday girl with Sarita. Um, and uh, so uh, the, uh, the lady, the lady, Leilani, who I can butcher in Canada. Uh, she got together and she made a beautiful cake. So we're going to have a lot to eat and I want you to enjoy yourself and uh, down in front. And uh, we're going to go ahead and pray. You can sit right there and we'll pray and uh, we'll go ahead and be both good Baptists and we'll eat. Uh, let's, uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the almighty God that you are. That you reached down and uh, took a little country boy like me and you as I tried to walk away from you, you went, uh -uh -uh. you're not leaving me. And boy, you were with me when I didn't even know him. And then you took the other young man who grew up in a Jewish faith and thought he was special. Found out that he, he was because you loved him. And he found out that you died for him. That's what makes us all special. Lord, we ask that we don't never take the wonderful gift and the sacrifice that you did for granted. Humble us, Father. Break us where we need to be broken. Heal us where we need to be healed. Deliver us where we need to be delivered. We love you. We thank you for the food that you're blessing us with tonight, for the nourishment of our bodies. We ask that that gift never be taken for granted. So many are going without. We love you. We celebrate you. And it's in your precious name we pray. And all God's children say. Amen. 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 So let's go ahead and uh, we'll get the, the food over here. We'll get things started.
Ah, il va être en bas Thank <laughs> you.